So, hello everybody. Welcome to the Generation Nation podcast. I'm here with Mike Criglio, right? Criglio, correct? Criglio, correct. All right. He is the... What were you again? You were... I was a television uh, children's entertainer who had a television program um, on PBS stations across the country, as well as uh, a four-year stint on the Learning Channel. Okay. So. And... How how was that for you exactly? Uh, it was very exciting. I tell you, when we when I found out that I was on PBS stations across the country, um, it's really uh, it's a good feeling. It makes you feel like you've accomplished your goal, and now now that it's 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 out there across the country, uh, that was exciting enough as it is. And then we got then the uh, the Learning Channel picked us up for uh, four years and, yeah and that was a good run sure so everybody would watch pappy on pappy land was the name of the show okay p-a-p-p-l-a-n-d and when did this happen uh this started in 1993 uh i linked up uh with a friend of mine who wasn't a friend at the time i met him at a studio i was uh, renting space from a photographer in syracuse new york mm -hmm. and um he actually uh, was a guest at the photography studio and the guy that ran the studio said, hey, I know a, a guy here who's pretty creative. Uh, he's an illustrator artist, and uh, he, it might be interesting for you to go talk to him. So his name was John Napa, and he introduced himself to me and I, I to him. And uh, we hit it off really well. And I, after talking for a long period of time, uh, I finally popped the question, would you like to do a, a, a children's television program? Mm -hmm. And he said, I'd love to. I said, well, great, we can collaborate. I said, I have the concept and the idea for a character called Pappy Druitt. And that's kind of a play on words because Pappy's an artist and he drew Pappy Land. Uh -huh. So everything in Pappy Land is like fantasy and puppets and things. So he wrote the story Pappy Land. I created the character Pappy Druitt. And together we got the show on PBS and TLC. So was... was you said Pappy was an artist. Was he like another television artist? Or? No, no, no. No. Uh, I was the character Pappy, mm -hmm. and uh, the show was all about life skills. Okay. So we would teach children um, life skills like uh, don't feel bad if you lost something. So that was a show on loss, learning to deal with loss. And I'd always anchor each each uh, concept for each episode. There was a drawing that went with the concept. Okay. And that's where the drawing element came in. And uh, so... At the end of the show, I would have an address at the end of the uh, credits. Mm -hmm. Send in your drawings to Pappy. And uh, so we we got nailed with mail, tons of mail. Can kids you, were can sending you grab your mic and put a little closer yeah. to you real quick? Okay. Uh, kids like were that. sending their drawings like to all across the country, and we were getting them. And we were putting them in a segment of the show called the Hall of Frames. That's these it. were like little kids drawings? Like yeah, they're all crayons? like five. Yeah, the age group, the demographics for this show was between five and adult. Mm -hmm. Because there were some adults that actually enjoyed following along drawing. But mostly uh, five to like 13, 14-year-olds. Okay. That was kind of like the gamut right there. And so it was uh, – uh, the whole idea was to um, showcase my drawing. They would follow along as I did the drawing. And then we would say, hey, I have an idea. Let's go visit the Hall of Frames. And the Hall of Frames was this huge, like, uh, like a gallery of all the pictures that were sent in. Now, we obviously couldn't send in all of them. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, we couldn't showcase all of them. So all the ones that were sent in, some were left out. And in some of the email, some, excuse me, some of the mail that I got back then, uh, they would say, how come my drawing wasn't in the Hall of Frames? And this, I said, well, I'm sorry, I can't, we can't put all in there. It's impossible. Because there's well, too many of them. What was this Hall of Frames like? Was It, it was like, um, it was a digital creation, okay. totally digital. It had pillars and a door would open up. And I kind of like dancing with my pencil. I had a big red pencil. And uh, on the walls were uh, digital images of all of the drawings. And they were framed digitally. Mm -hmm. So it looked like a museum with just kids' drawings. And I would kind of, and then, I, you know, as I would go into the room, they would fade and just show one picture after another uh, and showcasing some of the pictures that were sent in. And again, we couldn't get them all. You know, it's impossible. So, How did, how did you choose between the drawings? Did you just pick them <clears throat> randomly? Uh, I wasn't involved in that. Um, I saw the pictures they chose, but I didn't do, somebody else had it. I was busy taping the shows. Okay. So, because we did 65 episodes. 
And how long did that take? You said four years for, for that well, initial one? Well, was... it was a three. We started in 1993. So in 1994, 95, we did the first 16 episodes. Mm -hmm. I did that with John Knapp, with my friend. He's the co-creator. And at that point, he left, and I, I merged with another company, another executive producer. Okay. And uh, his name was Eric Roberts. And uh, we at that point, we continued to make a full total of 65. But at that point, we hit 16 when I first started. Mm -hmm. And as time went on, the shows got better and more, you know, uh, because of the technology. And we started to – we shot most of the uh, shows at PB, uh, WCNY, which is a PBS station in Syracuse, New York. Okay. And this first 16 we shot in Rochester at a studio because that's all we could we didn't we didn't have like a a, a deal with uh, PBS yet at that point. Oh, so you were you weren't like funded by them, you were just no, licensing no. them? No, no. We were actually paying uh at, after we did the first 16, mm -hmm. we paid, you know, WCNY to to you for the use of the studio. So they basically provided the studio and the big huge uh, blue screen. Mhm. Mm and uh, and they provided the sound, camera equipment, and the green room uh, lunch. We'd always have like a big lunch, you know. It was fun because we'd go into the green room after a shoot, you know, and it'd be like pizza and and, and big salads. And how'd you how'd you guys even make money off it if you were paying them for? Well, like how 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 did that even work for them? Yeah, I know that was. Uh, um, well, we got uh, we had an investor first of all. For we had money, mm -hmm. John and I did it. Uh, he. When John and I did it first, he didn't have a lot of money, and a guy was willing to put in like fifty thousand to get it started. And after that, like I said, we did the first sixteen. John left, and the new investor came in, and he put in one point five million. Oh my God! What, what do you think that looks like today? <laughs> it's peanuts compared to what they're doing now. But that helped us to do uh, a total of sixty-five shows, and we had deals. Um, you know, we. Like some of the um, stations had to pay us to put us on. Mm -hmm. So you license out the show yeah, to, to these know, stations. Yeah, and so that's basically how it works. I'm still getting um, fan mail now on TikTok. It's big. Yeah. I'm big on TikTok. I got 41,000 followers, likes. I got 40,000 subscribers. Just just from the residuals of Papula? Just from uh, people who are no longer five and six. They're your age. They're in their either their early 20s. And they, they still remember you. They remember they, me they, because they were five and six. They, they went and found you on there? They're like, well, you they, know, back when I was a kid, I, I watched this guy. And yes, instead they're exactly. like, let me go see if he's around. And they're like, that's oh, right. look, there's Papula. In fact, that's what they say all the time. They go, pinch me. Pinch me. I don't think, am I dreaming? Is this you, Pappy? Is this you, Pappy? And, I'm, and it's like really flattering to see all these comments. And they're all flipping out. And so now I have like, if you go to uh, Pappy Land, just type in Pappy Land or doodles or art or drawing mm -hmm. on TikTok, those hashtags will bring you to, to my site That's or my, you know, my page or whatever you want to call it on TikTok. I don't even know what they call it anymore. That's insane. I bet they'd freak out if they uh, they knew what. And I commented, what we got to go you know, on. I commented to a lot of them, you know, but there's just too many. It's just too many, so I can only comment so much, you know. When you got a, when you got like 30, 40 people are popping and all commenting, I mm -hmm. go, wow, it's like it gets it gets overwhelming, kind of overwhelming. overwhelming. Yeah, it's, that's the word. It's funny you talk about those people following you and stuff and then like all freak out about it being you because when I first learned that you you did the thing, I was like. Oh, okay. But to, to me, when I first met yeah, you, you didn't, I didn't know you at you all. Never, you, how old are you? I'm 23 now. Okay, yeah. You would be too young, so. Yeah. But when I, I Same first. Same with uh, the other guys here. They're too young. Yeah. Now, now Ryan, mm -hmm. you have the other Ryan, mm -hmm. he's 30-something. Oh, yeah. So his his uh, mother had uh, uh, saw reruns or something, or they had uh, taped they had taped some of the shows, and they showed him when he was younger. Mm -hmm. So he knew about Pappy. So when I met Ryan, he said, you're Pappy? No way. I said, yeah, well, do I look like him? Said, yeah, you do. I said, well, I'm Pappy, you know. So anyway, so uh, it was a fun, it was a, it was a great experience in my life. And, you know, it's it took me from then to here, mm -hmm. and here I am. Let's Let's talk about the puppets. You had a lot of puppets oh, for the show. Yeah. And I've yes. I've seen your newer ones for it and they've yeah. definitely increased in uh, not only quality but like it's 
what they're able to do now is oh, fantastic yeah. compared to what they looked like before. Oh, I know. Well, that, you know, most like for instance, if this let's say the show was created now, mm -hmm. you wouldn't have puppets. You'd have digital mm -hmm. animation that would be merged with the live action. Yep. So, and you know, that's that's exciting to know that that, that, that people can do that now. Of course, look at all the Disney movies and Pixar and. Oh my God! It's just yeah, there's, there's something about your puppets that you have that has a charm. Well, it's... you know the reason. Um, well, thank you for that. The reason that I I designed the puppets that way because mm -hmm. at the time uh, Sesame Street was big, mm -hmm. and I didn't like the design of those puppets. They were cute, but they were just like round balls with a slit for the mouth yep. and half of a ping pong ball for the eyes. I said, Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna go a little better. I'm gonna take that a notch higher. So I made, like when I did Turtle Lou and all the other puppets, I made them look a little more realistic and more true to what, what those characters would be, a turtle and, mm -hmm. and, a, and a woodchuck. And we did uh, Buddy Bear, and I did the little talking brush. So And we had and the old-timer Elmer, that was the most popular character. That I still have that now. Do you have the original one still? or I you... have the original Elmer, yeah. that's uh, I just kind of cleaned him up a little bit, you know, put some new clothes on him. Is that the one that you're using in your studio now? Yes. Oh, so there's not two of them where you no, can just go. Uh, no, that, that's you, the, you can bring them both together and be like, they're oh, hi. all original puppets. And you got to remember, the show was shot. Was, uh, and, the puppets were, you know, yeah, they were hanging the... around in my studio in 1997. And I still have them right now. Mm -hmm. So you do But didn't you that. make a new one for the tree? The tree is just a different puppet. Yeah. I have the original tree, but it's not in the studio there. I okay. still have all the original puppets, but... Uh, the tree that you saw and the rock mountain, those are all recent puppets. Mm -hmm. And the mouse, that's the recent puppets. The mouse? Yeah, there's a mouse there. He's called uh, Sneaky Pete. Oh, I haven't seen the mouse yeah, in the studio Yeah, he comes up yet. like this and he looks around, he goes down, and he pops up all over the place. So right now you're, you're creating shorts with the old puppets. Yes, I'm taking uh, the new tree puppet that I made and the old – and the old and the, actually, it's the new Elmer puppet because I put a new shirt on him. I fixed them up, painted the chair, mm -hmm. and um, it's a show called, and you can see it on um, uh, YouTube, my YouTube, Michael Coriglio YouTube channel. You can see uh, the porch talk, I call it, okay. where where the tree asks these uh, uh, profound questions, and, and Elmer gives these snotty kind of, you know, like the old guy, he's an old agitator, you know, and he always gives a funny reply to a serious question. So that I thought that was a nice niche for the idea of porch talk because it all takes place on the porch. He's mm -hmm. sitting on the porch, Elmer, and the tree is out front. And on each episode, they have a little conversation. What uh, what made you want to come back and start doing more puppet shows like that? Because you're retired now, correct? I retired, and uh, when you're a creative person, uh, you can't retire. Uh, I don't know any creative people that just – sit around and do nothing <laughs> they have to create they have to do something they have to build something mm -hmm. make something paint something you know what i mean create from anything from a creative standpoint they're going to do now i know i have a lot of friends and i live in, a, in what they call a gated community and i tell you what people don't do too much there they just kind of mow their lawn and walk around and uh i said that's that's not me yeah that's, how old are you now You're in your i'm 72 72 yeah, yeah i'll be yeah so and uh, I'm I'm shocked that I'm still here, so because <laughs> I was I'm a Vietnam veteran on top of that, so mm -hmm. I I thought I was going to die in Vietnam to be honest with you, and uh, when I when I got out of that debacle, mm -hmm. I I wasn't doing too well after the military, you know I had my ups and downs, uh, you know because most people that got out of Vietnam the uh, they really didn't do anything for a long time they had a justice society. And it took me a while to adjust, and uh, I did all the wrong things. I was drinking and smoking and doing everything. People used to say, you're a wild man. I go, wait a minute. <laughs> I, I don't wear that title well, but that's what they call me because – and then I think about that now, and I go, that's not how I wanted to be, but that's how I was after Vietnam. But I changed. So know. the uh, the uh, the child – Show star Pappy is actually just a, a wild child. I was a wild. I was pretty wild. Well, I wasn't wild before Vietnam. No. It's as soon as I got to Vietnam. Fried your nerves. <laughs> fried my nerves. I had no feelings. I couldn't. You know, if you told me your father died, I'd say, "Who better him than me?" And that's a very rude thing to say to somebody. You know what I mean? Instead of saying, "Hey, I'm sorry," mm -hmm. <laughs> that's what I used to say. Oh, better him than me, man. Oh man. How'd, so how'd you go? How'd you go from like uh, Vietnam? 
veteran oh, to yeah. now now yeah, you're starting let me to... tell you what happened after vietnam i went through this like stagnant do nothing period mm -hmm. it was just partying so i wasted like about 13 years of my life 13 years 13 years holy i was going i was just doing nothing i mean i was doing some artwork don't get me wrong i was doing i always will do artwork but i wasn't really getting a job i wasn't doing anything i was like uh somebody would hire me and then i would quit you know mm -hmm. what i mean i just didn't have it have it down uh, I was just too mixed up. So finally, um, as time went on, in the um, oh late 80s, mm -hmm. um, I went into uh, advertising in Rochester. The guy gave me a tremendous opportunity there for a job. He wanted me to do, like, storyboards. Mm -hmm. And back then, you know, that's a pretty, pretty good job for a guy that never went. To, I never went to college. Yeah. So I just had the talent. I'm, I'm always, like... You know what I mean? So we're, Riding the laurels of my talent. Were you, uh, were you like, uh, did you, did you like paint and do art stuff when you were a child, and that just kind of yeah, carried over? Yeah, yeah. I used to go. I was in a Catholic school, mm -hmm. and uh, you know they had the nuns, the crazy nuns, mm -hmm. <laughs> the rulers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Have you heard that, that oh, yeah. kind of thing? In Sunday school, uh, they kicked me out because I would color the Jesus colorings uh, like green and different <laughs> things, and I got kicked out of the Catholic Sunday <laughs> school here. Well, I was. On a desk similar to this, only it was a small child's desk, you know. Mm -hmm. I had a ballpoint pen. Yeah. And I was I was digging into the table a picture of Daniel Boone. <laughs> because, you know, I'm older than you, so that was like a character back then. And I'm drawing Daniel Boone, right, with that coonskin hat and mm -hmm. everything, you know. And, then, and the nun caught, caught her, you know, my, her eye caught my, my doodling. And she came over to the desk and she goes, Michael Crigleo? That's a very nice drawing, but that's wrong what you're doing. Put your hand out. No lie. So I put my hand out in this big stinking ruler with a big metal edge. Mm -hmm. She whacked my hand really hard, and I tell you, it hurt. And I was really bummed. I said, these, these nuns are crazy. I don't want to... You know, I don't want to categorize them or anything, but that nun was crazy. She hit me really hard. <laughs> you know, I'm going, oh... With a wooden, it's like like taking a stick and hitting somebody. Anyway, so that was uh, that's the beginning of my. Oh, you can draw. Look at that. You drew Daniel Boone, and I. And then in high school, it translated into I was drawing cartoons all the time. Everybody wanted me to draw a cartoon or something or someone. So one day I drew a cartoon. He wanted me to. A friend of mine wanted me to draw a cartoon of the uh, um, the the dean of the school. You know, mm -hmm. and uh, <laughs> so. And I, I kind of made a, a cartoon of a rat, and, and he was on the toilet, and I drew his face on it. So it looked like him, but it was a rat, you know. And mm -hmm. apparently he saw it. And I remember when I was in the, in the classroom uh, over the loudspeaker, well, Mike Wrigley, oh, please come to the office. <laughs> I, said, I went, oh, boy, he must have found that drawing. They, they knew it was you from the drawing? They, they knew it was me because I'm the only one in the school that could draw like that. Wow. that's uh... Four years, I got four A. You know, uh, gold awards, lousy grades, but I got great awards for my art every year. Freshman all the way up until I was a senior, I got certificates of excellence. So, so what was it like being a? Well, you said you were a storyboard like artist. Well, yeah. So, well, let me tell you. Let me uh, show you the progression of this. So, after high school, I graduated, and I got drafted. That's how I went to Vietnam. I did apply though to um, Kansas uh, State mm -hmm. uh, Art School, and I. I said, I made a decision. I think I'm going to just go and get this military thing over with, which was the worst thing I could have done, but I did it. <laughs> um, and then, uh, so I went into Vietnam. When I got into Vietnam, I wasted a lot of time. And then I, and that's when I went to uh, this advertising agency in Rochester, and he gave me a job mm -hmm. as a storyboard artist. And I was still not right. And my, and my presentation wasn't professional yet. I, I haven't learned. I didn't learn what it took to be a, a total professional. Mm -hmm. So that, but this is the progress, you know, everything was a, a step by step. So I, I showed him my portfolio, which is all just a bunch of crap in a folder. And because the art was good, see, I always been successful on the laurels of my talent. So he saw the, he saw the artwork and I'm not trying to toot my own horn. It's just, I can draw. Mm -hmm. So he, Looked at it and said, oh, you'd be perfect for this. Would you like to do some storyboards? And actually, I hated storyboards. But I figured I would do them because it was a job. So I started there. And two weeks later, I said, I'm, I'm sick of doing storyboards. So I quit on them. And that was the worst weeks? thing I could have done because uh, 
out in the back parking lot. There was a kitchen near the, uh, near the facing the, the parking lot in the back where all the cars were parked. Mm-hmm. And I quit, and I remember t- walking out, and as I got into the parking lot, there was that kitchen window there. Mm-hmm. He literally, this is no lie, he threw a beer bottle through that window, and I, <laughs> and I took off in my car, and I took off. <laughs> He literally threw a beer bottle he, through the kitchen window. So they seriously. Were, they were already drinking. They were drinking like at work. No, no. It no? was just something that was in the kitchen there because it was in the middle of the day. It was like noon. And he just he just, he just saw grabbed, you? He, he just he was, grabbed and he threw it right through the window. When I saw that window crash and a bottle coming out, I said, he is really pissed. And boom, I had it for my car and that was... So I got kind of blacklisted from uh, Rochester at that point. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. Nobody wanted to hire me there because I quit. He gave me a great opportunity to work in an advertising agency. People go to school for that, mm-hmm. to, to be able like a graphic artist or what have you, right? And I just quit on him. So I felt bad about that over time. As I started to adjust and I got a little more mature, I, uh, you know, I started to feel bad about that. And this was in your 30s that this happened? Uh, I was, no, I was younger than that. I was younger than that. It was more like 27, 26, 27, yeah, in that time, time frame. Anyway, so I went back to Syracuse, mm-hmm. and uh, I got, and I had a lot of, I was doing a lot of freelance, by the way. After I quit, right, mm-hmm. I said, I'm going to freelance. So I did get a few jobs even though they kind of blackballed me, you know, that's the agencies. But I, I contacted people directly and showed them my work. And so the Genesee Brewing Company in in, actual, in Rochester gave me these college posters to do. And it was a regular gig. I was doing I was doing all kinds of posters for them. And it was a good job back then. I was getting like $1,000. Back then, $1,000 was like a lot of money. You oh, know? yeah. So I did like several posters. And then I moved out of Rochester and went to Syracuse. And then I, I put an application in at another agency, and they hired me. And uh, I was they were bringing in uh, – people were calling me that I used to do freelance work that I had in Rochester. They mm-hmm. were calling me to do work. And the guy that I – the new employer, right, he was taking that those jobs and keeping most of the money. And, and I got mad. I said, wait a minute. I'm bringing these jobs into the agency. I want at least – you know, three quarters, and you take the, the 25%, I'll take the 75 Wait, so, so... So he was doing the opposite. He was keeping 75% and giving me the 25 I'm going, wait a minute now, that's not a fair cut. That's how I looked at it. So in other words, um, I'm getting uh, a poster. They want another poster. So it's going now, it's going to this agency I work for. Mm-hmm. And they're keeping most of the money, and they're going to pay me... Uh, they're paying me weekly, so I don't get, you know, so that would have been extra money for me, but it was penis because they were cutting it so low, you know? Yeah. So, so anyways, I quit that job. <laughs> what, what what advice would you have for people then uh, who are artists now and trying to just make money through their, their work? First of all, get, uh, you know, go to school, mm-hmm. get as much schooling as you can, especially if you're not that great of an artist. Um, you can always learn to be a better artist. Some people have natural talent, you know, there's natural piano players, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? Uh, there's natural guitar players uh, and there's natural artists and some people have to learn to be an artist but that's okay because I know a lot of people uh, that are artists and, and, and they're very technical and, and they're well learned and that's what I would say you know go to school get all the uh, uh, you know go to workshops uh, put together a professional portfolio after high school and then go go knock on the doors, you know, send up. Of course, now you don't have to. You can send through, you can do uh, digital samples mm-hmm. uh, with email. See, back then I had to go and knock on doors. I had to get a list of all the agencies in town. Then I had to set up appointments with each one. Then I would bring my portfolio, which was at that point was professional finally. And um, and and uh, so that's, uh, that's basically, that would be my advice is just go, uh, just be professional and, and you know, there's no shortcut to success. You, you know, if you want to be successful, you've got to work at it. You got to work hard. You can't just like, eh, you know, be fly by night and just, oh, you know, nonchalant about everything. That's not how it works. You got to be diligent. It's just like some of these actors and actresses, you know, or they, they, they don't even watch their movies. They make all these movies and some of them haven't even seen any of them. They're so busy, yeah. you know? So I, I, that's really simple advice. You know, I think that's the normal advice for anybody who's going into some kind of profession would be to work hard, be diligent and, you know, just be professional because they want professional. So then, so after you started doing your posters gigs, right? How did you go from that to then oh, eventually leading to Happyland? Oh, yeah. So after, again, so um, after that, 
I uh, decided to get a studio, and that's when I got a studio in Syracuse. Mm -hmm. And that's when that fellow came in, John Napa, and we collaborated to do the first 16 episodes. And, uh, and, and then after that, the new investor came in because John had left. So a new investor came in, and we, we continued to make uh, uh, you know, a total of 65 episodes and, uh, at WCNY. And we were on um, – I was getting mail from all across the United States and the world. I was getting uh, mail from France. Mm -hmm. I got a letter from Bahrain. I got a, a, a from, you know India. Um, uh, there was what else? Yeah, Gaza, Israel, and Gaza. People from those two sectors were sending me Pappy fan mail. Seriously, it was flattering. When so I you got, you were a very global. Uh, it was global. Re yeah, it got show. global because you know with the with the uh, there was a uh, satellite feed that they paid us so that we can they can put our shows up on a satellite and so they could go all international. So we had so a lot of people were watching it, and it was funny because people think that you know in, people in Gaza they're like terrorists, but they're not. No, they're, they're not all people. terrorists. They're just people like anybody in Israel. You know, all these two people fighting each other. They're just people, and they have children, they have families. It's uh, it's the other elements, you know, the government uh, elements that you know. So anyway, so um, after Pappy, which was uh, really exciting for me, and when we get on the Learning Channel, that was really fun. Because oh, that's yeah? a big deal. Oh, by the way, my show was uh, rated one of the top 10 children's shows in 1997. And that's along with Barney and Superman. There was a Superman series at the time. The animated series? Yes. Yep, I know when that I'm first came out, we were in the top 10 with those shows. Uh, there was another show called um, Elliot. Uh, it was a cartoon. No, it's, it wasn't. Uh, uh, I can't remember the name of that cartoon, but there was like several uh, big comfy couches. It was all kinds Are you of. Thinking shit. of Arthur. Arthur, thank you, thank you, Ryan. Good. good I actually meeting. know that when I had a video, I had a, one of the Arthur video games as a kid, and I played yeah, it all and the time. Yeah, so Arthur, I was in, with that cat. So I was in a pretty good elite group, Man, that, and that, that was a nice pinnacle for me. I got excited when we made. And now TV Guide, TV Guide is like gone. They don't even have that because everything's streaming. It's. It's insane to think that you were that big back then, and I had no clue who you were. Well, you but, were too young. Well, no, because those things I knew about. Like I knew, I knew about the animated series. I knew about uh, Barney Pat or uh, Barney right. Arthur. This is, well, how old were you in '97? '97, so. I was still in the womb. There you go. You see, that's what I mean. So how could you use? You couldn't possibly. But, but some of know. those things carry over till to like the oh, next yeah. couple years after. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I was I was still a kid in yeah. or up until about. Uh, 2003. Well, the, yeah, well, the show ended about 2003, 2004. That's yeah. when we finally turned. So I, I should have, I should have been old enough to see it if it well, was rerunning. Probably were in going in different directions. I don't know. You're too sophisticated. <laughs> too sophisticated. Yes. That's one way to describe. That's it. how tech geeks are, man. They're super sophisticated. They're beyond that childish stuff. They just want to know about tech, high tech stuff. I mean, you say that, but when I was five, you I did. Did. I took three boxes of just cables because my dad worked at a Gateway. If you remember what those were, yes, uh, and he just had wires from there, and I took them and I put together uh, two TVs and had them display the same image with just a bunch of cables running through. What? Because I didn't want my brother watching the wow. same television as me, <laughs> so I set him up on a different one. I was like, you watch TV over there. Wow. I'll watch it on the big one over here. Holy cow, that's amazing. Yeah, so mm. you were pretty uh, tech savvy. Now the funny thing is. VHS. Mm -hmm. I just we were shooting on standard definition back yep. back then. There was no high def. Nope. I mean, and it, it, we we were on the uh, precipice of high def. We were right on the cup. You know what I mean? It, it, as soon as we finished the shows, high def came right in, and I yep. went, um, and the digital world opened up, and I went, wow, I wish it was. So I could do some of the visuals that I did on the show. Mm -hmm. I could do that now in my studio downstairs. I have a oh, yeah. studio, and I can do so much more with the equipment I have all by myself than paying these people twenty thousand uh, dollars for doing this and that and this and that. You know what I mean? At the studio, at the PBS studio. Yeah. And their effects were like <sighs> nothing Gar garbage compared to today. Oh my gosh, it's like amazing. What well, I, I mean, do now. You, you look at the studio here, right? And this, uh, like, just twenty years ago, was like a hundred thousand dollar studio, and oh. now doing it for far less. Listen, all you need is a good multimedia computer, a powerful, you know, computer with some uh, third-party plugins mm -hmm. to do effects. 
uh, good camera, good sound, uh, uh, a good uh, audio, good audio with a good microphone. Sennheiser is a good brand like you use. And there's a lot of brands. I, I use Shure, Yep, Sennheiser. that's what these microphones are. Yeah, so I, I use a little bit of each, you know, whatever I can afford at the time, actually. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's amazing what you can do. So I am working on a show now called Paps Art Ventures. Um, but it, we're trying to sell it, but it's very difficult. So uh, are you trying to sell like a brand new like Pappy Land style thing? Or well, is it it's just a like spin a spin-off. It's a spin-off. The character is the same, only I dress different. It's the same guy, Pappy, mm -hmm. but they call me Pap now, Paps, uh, because I, I shortened it, Paps Art Ventures. So Art Ventures is basically me going on a venture, mm -hmm. an artistic venture. So the first episode was me going, I'm in Florida, so the first episode was me going to the Gator Gator Farm. Okay. And, uh, excuse me, did I make a sound? Hi. <laughs> when you do that, you probably will. <laughs> yeah. So um, so I, I went as Pap. Mm -hmm. uh, I, first, I went and shot the footage at the gator farm because the show is about uh, drawing an alligator. Mm -hmm. So our, our venture uh, took us to the gator farm. And I had this device called um, the uh, Scopey. Okay. And he, he's like a, uh, a TV. He's like a monitor. But he's like. He's like a, a robot, you know, and, you know, I push a button and he goes, today's journey is going to take you to the gator farm. And I go, oh, thanks. And I go, where's that located? St. Augustine, Florida. So it's kind of like a digital kind of robotic voice. And and that's the sequence of the show. We have the art venture. Mm -hmm. Then I come back to the studio and we have an art guest. We have a guest that challenges me to do a doodle. And then they leave after that. Then I and then I uh, do my drawing of what we saw at Gatorland. And so I did a nice drawing of a, of a, you know, an alligator. And I tell the differences between an alligator and a crocodile and this and that. And it's educational. It's called edutainment. Mm -hmm. You entertain the kids and yet you're showing, uh, uh, you're doing drawing. And they follow along. See, my show, Pappy Land, was a follow along show. Everybody drew with me. And some people said, I can't keep up. So... So what stopped you from getting this like fun? You're trying to get funding for well, it for like it's a... not the funding. Is I, I did a I did a sample. I did a, so you did a uh, pilot. Yeah, I did a pilot. Yeah, and uh, it's very difficult to get into uh, Netflix or any of these big shot. You know, but don't you, you said uh, what you have like forty two thousand followers or something? Yeah. All right. So why don't you go? Uh, why don't you see if you can get a petition started? Right. Get all show it to all the people. Right. Uh, get a bunch of signatures on it, and then send that to one of these companies and see if uh, with that support behind How would it, I get the signatures? How would you do the signatures? They would do, send, email them to me? Yeah, do, uh, what is it? Do a virtual poll. So you, there's websites where you can, like, set up a virtual poll or virtual even just... poll, I like uh, that. Poll or, uh, what is it called? It's a... Uh, GoFundMe kind of thing? No, 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 no. Although you could do, a, you could do a, a Kickstarter for it, too, to get the funding if you've got the people for it. But what I'm thinking of is a petition. There's like petition websites. So maybe set up like a petition for like Netflix or Hulu or one of those channels and go ahead. put it out and get people to go uh, sign up and put their signature behind it. Show, show them that there's potential behind it. Yeah. Here's the, here's the, the roadblock is some of the specifications mm -hmm. that they want for you. You know, they have a list of things you have to do to qualify. Okay. One of them was to have a red camera, which is thirty grand. Oh, and it had, everything has to be done in four K. Mm -hmm. And I said, "Look, I'm just trying to sell them a concept. They usually buy and support if they like it. They buy and they'll pay you to produce the show. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I can't give them that kind of quality in my pilot. But I gave my it's high definition and it's all colorful. It looks fine." That's and I can't get through to anybody. We sent it to somebody, nobody even bothered to uh, respond. And, and, it, and it requires you to have specifically a red camera or a 4K camera. No, a red. Specifically a it's, red. Yeah, things have to be shot with a red camera. <sighs> and I'm going, yeah, well, that puts me out of the ballpark already, you know. So I said, well, look, I thought I, and that's what I didn't like about Netflix as far as that goes, is is they're so strict. I mean, why not just say, oh, look at this concept. We love this concept. I think we can back this and then we can make a good production, mm -hmm. make a good quality production. I didn't get that. They just didn't even, uh, they never, never responded. Then maybe the first thing you try you to. You need to know somebody, Ryan. You need to know somebody there that has a connection. Well, you're not wrong. But what I'm saying is try going through the Kickstarter route 
to get support so that you could get because if the camera is the main thing you need right now to get it going right. maybe take your followers see how many of them truly want to support you start just a gofundme or kickstarter to just acquire the camera so you can start to produce the show at the base level and then get the funding well i mean that you know that. i i think but that's like putting the horse in front or behind the because i i the camera I'm selling a concept show. Here's a concept for a for a here's a pilot for a brand new series. Mm -hmm. I don't need I don't need that. a high definition pilot's fine for them to look at. See if they were smart and they weren't so sophisticated and so you know. Well, I think it's more about standards. They have a standard. Yeah, they, they do. With. But the standard would be there once I get the okay to create the shows. Then the standard is what their standard is. Mm -hmm. It's all shot. The new shows would be shot with the red camera. They probably provide the camera. They probably that would be in the budget form. You know, we'll need this, we'll need that. And and uh, usually they give you, I think the bottom line is they would give you like uh, um, 100 or 150,000 for kid shows. Mm -hmm. It's somewhere in that ballpark. That's what it is. They'll give you 150,000 to, to do uh, um, like six episodes or something to get it started. Mm -hmm. But see, that's what I mean. I, they won't even let me get to that point. <laughs> it's, it's crazy. Well, that's what I'm saying. Just well, yeah, if, if you're going to do it, and I mean, maybe don't even go through Netflix. But. I, I don't want to buy a $30,000 camera or $25,000 camera right now because I don't have, um, I'm not trying to make the shows. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to create a pilot. That's why I got a studio here. I wanted to create a pilot, which I did. Yeah. And it's just sitting there now. And, and you know, and I'm sending it out. We sent it out to um, Prime. Mm-hmm. Netflix, and we got no reply. And yet, I go on TikTok, and I get 41,000 followers and within six months, not even six months. It's amazing. I just put a little drawing on there. There's already 13,000 likes on it. I mean, 1,300. And, and four or five days ago, I put it on there. Four <laughs> and five days, I got 1,300 and climbing. And it's just a little doodle. I, I, I like to make, uh, I doodle out of words. Mm-hmm as well as numbers and letters from the alphabet. But now I'm doing whole words and turning it into a drawing. So I did the word who, and I made two bulldogs sitting together near a, near a flower patch, all out of the word who, and people are loving it. I have the demographics. That's why I love your idea about that list. Yeah, the petition list. The petition list, because there's everybody saying, we loved your show, we loved your show, we loved your show. And these are not mothers and fathers of the kids. These are the actual kids. Yeah. So this impact is from the horse's mouth. That's what I'm saying. Just okay. If you're not gonna do it through the, if you're not gonna do a, a GoFundMe to get the camera right, maybe try and reach out through your followers to see if anyone has a connection, or even just uh, start putting the stuff out there. Start getting it. Maybe get a word out. See if anyone's got the. So connections. I got my YouTube channel, which yeah. is uh, advertising uh, the Papstar Ventures. Um, but I mean, I mean, get it so that people know that you're looking to get on here. Maybe they'll have the connection you need. Yeah, right. yeah, it takes uh, my, uh, what I've learned, you know, at my age, what I've learned is you need money to make money. Yeah, that's. You know that to be a fact. Uh, yeah. It's everything, you need money to money. make money because everything you do is a maneuver that costs. Mm -hmm. Okay, I need this. I need a green screen. I need this. I need that. I need that. I need actors. I got to sign. Uh, I got to sign some voice people. I need some puppeteers. See, it all adds up. Now it's adding up to the point where you need a regular production company. That's why I'm trying to sell the pilot to somebody that can provide all that stuff, mm -hmm. you know, and, and just, and, you know, just let me do it on the laurels of what the show's about and, and, the, and the fan base that absolutely love it. I have a tremendous fan base and I am going to do that. I think I am going to do that petition thing. I think it's a great idea. Well, that's good because that's, you know, if you want to move forward, you got to do something yourself. If they're not going to take the initiative to do it, then I think you need to do it. I mean, you've done the, uh, the basic work, right? Getting the first, like... A uh, rough right. outline of the pilot done, right. but if they're not going to take the bait on it, you got to do something more to give it more attention, more Somehow, viability. I, you know, I, I've got to get it. I, what I need is a connection. Mm -hmm. I do have one connection. Uh, my son said he has. He knows somebody that knows somebody at Netflix, okay. but that doesn't necessarily equate. Know somebody that knows somebody, that knows right? Somebody. Yeah. So that doesn't equate into anything. You know, that's just like hearsay, as far as I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. um, it has to be somebody. Here's one of the uh, um, items that was on the list that you had of the criteria that had to be met yeah. to get on Netflix. 
One was you needed a producer. See how they see how they make it difficult. Mm -hmm. I need a producer now to go and approach Netflix, and the producer has to have the qualifications either of a novelist or a producer. He has to be a writer or a producer. Okay. And if he wrote a book, that's even more. That's great. And what's what's okay? So so imagine that I've got to have a producer. the pilot has to be shot in a uh, red camera. I'm going, I'm not putting it on the air yet. I want to sell the concept to you. Mm-hmm. That's the whole idea. They're not doing things that way anymore, you know? So then uh, what, would it ta- what would it take to be the producer? Because what if, what if I came with you and was like, I'm, right. I'm the producer. I've got a you production You can't just company. say you have to have a, re- uh, a resume, man. Uh, that's, uh, that's what makes how do you How do you have a resume of stuff if you're, because you're I never produce anything? Because I pro- if a producer did shoot something okay and they have a resume and that resume qualifies them as a producer and that and they and they know they can tell if you're not a producer because they it's fraudulent to do that you can't do that you can't have a guy pretend to be a producer and then do but you can't you can't if you're not already making stuff then how are you not a producer if you're producing content how are well, you i not mean i'm a producer? a producer but i they want a producer to represent me imagine that that they, they want a producer to represent the, the That doesn't make doing. sense. Because I'm the producer of this show right here that I, I right. do in the studio. This is my production. They want well I'm the producer they don't want to it. talk to the creative person. They want to talk to a producer. They want the producer to be like your overseer. You know what I mean? It's, so I can show you. I tell you what, I have the list. Yeah. I have all the criteria on a piece of paper. Mm-hmm. I'll, I'll gladly show it to you after this podcast. Oh, I, I, I'd, I'd love to see it because that makes it that makes, that makes really no sense to me, right? Why? If I'm doing all the work for this show, right? I'm the producer of this exactly. show. I, if I want to be considered a real producer, I have to go get somebody and pay them to do the job that I'm already doing? Like, like uh, Right. It has to be uh, um, somebody who's a, a writer or a producer. And I'm going, what? I said, I'm, I'm just showing you a con. I'm just giving you... A concept idea for a pilot. Let's do it together, and if it flies, which I think it will, especially I have all the all the uh, signatures backing it up. How much they love the show. Mm-hmm. I mean, they absolutely love that. I'm not getting like, yeah, your show is all right. It's like, oh my god, oh my god, you taught me to draw. You taught me to draw. You taught me how to paint. You taught me everything. I went to art school because of you. Know, those are the replies I'm getting, and that's heavy duty stuff. Oh, that's yeah, that's fantastic. That's one of the things that I wanted to get out of this show was to get people inspired to go do that kind of stuff. There, I, like, I should show you. I could read some right now, actually. Yeah, why don't you pull it up? Let's see what we got here. Because I I love that kind of stuff. Is when when your work has inspired other people to do other things. That's what we really need. Here, going see if on. you can. Find the comments on there. I, I, there's my site there. All right. Uh, you want me to find the comment so through some, your inbox? or? Yeah, I don't know. On the uh, uh, wherever, uh, I'm not very good at navigating. I love putting stuff on there, but I'm terrible at navigating that thing. Is this TikTok? Yeah. I'm going to sound like a super old person. I don't, <laughs> you don't, I don't you, know how to use TikTok. Here, I, okay. I've, I've legitimately never used TikTok Okay, at let's all. see here. Because um, there's... I've just never been one to use got a lot of 41, social media for it. It says Pappy Jewett received a total of forty one thousand five hundred and thirty eight likes across all videos. Okay, and uh, that is a short period of time, by the way. This mm-hmm. is not like two three years. I just I just started TikTok like seven months ago. I mean, it's crazy. Well, for in- internet time, that's that's quite a lot. You, uh, I don't I don't know if you know this, but the internet time goes in like uh, a month is like a year in internet time. Right. But if you you're still having that kind of reach, like what's your uh, what's your actual follower count on there? Oh, 41.1 thousand. Forty one. Forty one. Okay, so you do have that 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 uh that I've larger got followers reach. and subscribers all in the four. What do the subscribers do? I don't know. They just they're followers. I mean, there's likes and the followers. Okay. Yeah, the subscribers. That's YouTube. So um, then. So I'm trying to okay. Listen to this comment here. This is from. Um, uh, Joan, Jonath and Wesley. Anyways, uh, I love you, Pappy. This is so wholesome. Um, I get a lot of, I love you, Pappy. I love your show. I love you. Oh, I wish you were back. I get all that stuff. I've got the ammunition. I've got the demographics in a positive way mm-hmm. that would ensure that, you know, uh, it gives somebody a reason to actually say, wow, he, they, he does have followers. People really did like this concept. Imagine redoing it in a, a more modern way with digital and, and mm-hmm. having a real good crew. 
They had the technology. You know, I would see, see, that's when I would hire people. They give me the budget. Now I bring in some digital art. I bring in some 3D artists. I bring in, I design the character. I'll have them do it, you know. Mm -hmm. See what I mean? You start having, now you can have a budget. And uh, with no budget, you can't do anything. Well, like so, like how you gathered your porf your art portfolio, you should start gathering those kinds of comments. Uh, create a portfolio of positive comments. Get the petition list. Uh, or and get like a like a GoFundMe or something like that to like start building support and then reapproach these executives or whoever it is you pitch the show to and be like boom here's my show here's the evidence here's the support this is the demographics right. we're gonna hit this is there's obviously an outcry I mean you get enough people out crying for something they'll put it on TV they'll reboot it in some way or another I mean plenty of shows have been saved just from that alone. Right. And even just been brought onto the air in general. So if you just take the time to get those things worked out, I think your your success rate's gonna go up drastically for what you could do. Um I don't know. I you know, I'm not very good at navigating this myself. Um like if somebody said there's you know, if there's fourteen hundred people that were looking at that last doodle I did, uh, there must be some kind of comments mm -hmm. from those people. Well, it depends on the platform. Some platforms have comment sections. Some don't. Yeah. Uh, see, 1.4 thousand views. More data. Let's see what that says. Nah. I don't want to waste your time. No, nah, that's all right. Uh, but anyway, so I do have the demographics. I have the followers. Um, some people um, actually come and visit me. Mm -hmm. When they come down to Disney World, they stop here. They, they, yeah, they stop here and visit me because they ask in, in my, uh, you know, on my Instagram. I'm on Instagram. And they leave a message saying, "Pappy, if we're in the neighborhood and we're going down to Sea World, could we stop at your studio? Where are you located?" I go, well, "I'm in Ocala. Mm -hmm. I don't mind saying that. Yep. I'm in Ocala." And so, oh, we're gonna pass right through there on our way down to. I said, "Well, stop in." So I took a, I took a nice family portrait with the family. It was, and, I, and this is like the third family that stopped in. So that's kind of fun. Very flattering, you know. Here I am retired and all these people still remember me. Did, did, did the success from your show ever go to your head a little bit? Like um, you, you clearly had some level of fame. No, I was kind of like, I'm a, I actually I'm like to myself a lot, you know. Mm -hmm. I'm kind of a private guy, but yet I'm also, I'm an introvert and an extrovert at the same time. Mm -hmm. I really love to be around people and then I hate to be around people. I don't know if you know what I mean. I know exactly what you mean. I, I like being around people, but then... If it's a necessity, yeah. yeah if it's a necessity, no problem. But if I don't have to, don't worry. I'm not going to be there. Mm -hmm. I won't yeah, no, because it. <laughs> it, it gets exhausting to just it, it, interact continuously. Oh, it, it and that's, that's why I like this show the way it is, is like one-on-one. -on -one. But right. then when there's just a bunch of people in a room, uh, right. like uh, for the, the million cups that we do, it's, right. it's like... Uh, yeah, I like I like being in my office for that because there's I, just too many people. Yeah, I know you're not out there doing the taping of that. Well, I also record it from in here. Yeah, so you're in here kind of monitoring things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. But even still, I would prefer to you know not not yeah, be well, around here's, all the people. Here's the thing, you know, um, after Pappy Land ended, I continued to do appearances at schools as mm -hmm. Pappy. So oh, really? I'd be in an auditorium and it'd be like 300 kids, and you know different classes, mm -hmm. you know like for. Uh, third, fourth, and fifth graders all together in a big auditorium. And I would entertain them. And I, the way I would entertain them is with my doodles because I am I do uh, doodles. That's that's my that's Pappy's gig. He does doodles. So in other words, if somebody came up to the podium and, and the whiteboard, at this time we had the overhead projector with the clear sheets of paper. And I had like a, a, a special marker to draw on. Mm -hmm. We had those, and that was projected on a huge screen. Yeah. So that was what we had back then. Now we would probably use a digital, uh, you know. Uh, One of the Wacom tablets or something like that. Yeah, or something. But the whole idea is always to have a huge screen so that people out there could see it. So I would ask people to come up, and I would ask them to make a scribble. I go, okay, you have. You have one second to do a quick scribble. I don't want you to think about it. I want you to just do it as quick as possible. I'm going to count you down. Can I count on you? And, and they go, yep. So I go, one, two, three. I'm counting on them. And they laugh. I get that. That's my little cute little thing that the kids love. Mm -hmm. They used to love that when I would do that. And then I would spin them around. I go, okay, do your duel now, quick. And, and he go. And then I would make something out of it. And I tell you what, the parents 
parents were unbelievable. They were so enthralled with what I was. They were thrilled to watch me take a scribble and turn it into a drawing. They thought that was so amazing. The kids loved it too. Don't get me wrong. That's what I'm doing it for. But the, the parents were flipping out more than the kids. So that's what I used to do after Pappy. I entertained the kids. And then, of course, I, um, I did my own. You know, I did a lot of uh, how-to shows, mm -hmm. uh, how to use watercolors, how to use uh, a lot of those shows on my YouTube channel. So, um, And what's your YouTube channel? Michael Coriglio. It's just Michael Coriglio. Right. And if you type in, you know, go to YouTube and just type in Papuland, all kinds of stuff is going to pop up. It'll lead you at one point to, to my, you know, YouTube site. And um, I have a lot of shows on there. I have a lot of uh, how-to videos there. I have a lot of... Um, doodle videos where I, I draw from numbers and letters. Mm -hmm. um, and the most popular is when I made Batman out of the number seven. That was a real popular one. And, and that's on there. And I have a lot of other um, uh, how-to shows. How to, how to make a clay penguin. How to make a, a clay dog. How to make a clay rabbit. Um, you know, sculpting, watercolor, oils, pastels. I got all those shows on there. How-to. And they're very informative because I break down... For instance, if I show I have a show on oil colors, mm -hmm. I do it really cool because, see, I had the technology now with the digital world that we live in. I do a really nice video. I showcase all the different kind of canvases that you can buy, pad canvas, uh, frame, you know, framed canvas, and, and I, all the oil paints you can buy, good, bad, quality brushes. I show all the kinds of brushes. So my video is a very instruction. Uh, I mean, instruction heavy. So that's important, like for like people that are homeschooling, mm -hmm. they love those videos. And oh, I, yeah, I I was a homeschool kid for a good chunk of my yeah. So uh, was my son, right? And he's uh, and he's got a really good job now. He's doing well. Um, yeah. So that's uh, uh, so now basically what I'm doing now is I have my own studio here in, here in Ocala, mm -hmm. and I'm I'm uh, doing what I want to do. I'm I'm making puppets. I'm, I'm having fun creating uh, Paps Art Venture, yep. although I haven't really sold it yet. I wish somebody would uh, think about looking into that, the idea. How, and, how could they contact you if they were interested in it? Uh, they can contact me uh, um, at M. Carig well, I, don't, I, got, I have to be careful because I don't want everybody knowing my email address unless right. it's somebody who's important, you know. Um, so then, should they contact you through like uh, PM? They would have to on... have to come down uh, to Ocala, the Ocala. Um, well, actually, they could go and leave a message on um, pappyshop.com. Okay. Pappyshop.com. I'm selling T-shirts. And if you're a Pappy fan out there, I have a tremendous amount of Pappy paraphernalia and memorabilia that we're selling. I have actual script pages from the actual shows that we're selling. I have Pappy T-shirts. I have uh, the Pappy miniature pencil that I'm selling. Um and all this stuff goes, it's not just for me trying to get money out of everybody. I want to make money so I can buy material, art, art materials and be creative and still be creative. It's, it's helping funding my Pappy's creativity is what it is. So it's actually just funding your, your new venture to try and bring Pappy's right, uh, land. Right, right. I'm just Pappy, trying to. I'm, Pappy Pear, Paraphernalia back yes. into it. Uh, or bring just the concept of the show back yeah. so that a new generation could get a hold of it. Exactly. And, and those kids, they're all in their 30s now. That they're emailing me and texting me and showing up on TikTok in numbers, great numbers. Um, and, and they're loving all the stuff I'm selling. I have the original concept drawing that I had when I met John Napa, the guy that came into the ph photography studio mm -hmm. to visit. And, and we first met. And I told him I had this concept for a kid show. I showed him this conceptual drawing. And it was a real rough, real rough. It was like... Uh, uh, sharpie, a uh, fine sharpie, and a, and, a, and a medium sharpie, and I just used magic uh, uh, markers to color in and, and black in all the colors. And I had the, me sitting at a desk, and I had some of the characters I thought would be effective on the show. And that I made, I have copies now of those original conceptual drawing that I did, which started the whole Pappy show from this from scratch. So that conceptual print is my best seller. People love that. Really? Do you do you have it on a t-shirt though? Because that's, that's no, it's I... too hard to reproduce because it's too busy. There's too many lines and there's too many tones. Um, but they they have access to the actual uh, conceptual print. They can buy the print and most people frame them. 
Um, Jessica downstairs has one in her office. Does she? Way. Yeah, take a look. I'm going to have to go look at it. Yeah, after, she after has one frame. Um, and we have a lot of stuff. So um, feel free to go to pappyshop.com if you're interested. And I'm coming out with a new t- uh, new poster. It's called The Pappinator. The Pappinator. I'll be back if I get the funding. No. <laughs> <laughs> That is, that is what, that's the one you should go with for the, the petition. Thing. I'm I'll the Papinator. So I'm the Papinator. I want to do some, kids are into comic books. I love comics when I was a kid. I love all the Marvel movies. I've seen every one of them. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, I, I'm just so into the comic book look. So I decided to make a drawing of Pappy as, as the Papinator. So he's muscular and he looks like a comic book hero. Mm-hmm. And I call him, and the reason I say Papinator is because of uh, a friend of mine in Syracuse, uh, when I was going to this vineyard church on Sunday, he used to, he was uh, like a, uh, um, a youth pastor or something. He always walked by and he'd go, the Papinator. And I'd go, I like that. i go, I like that, the Papinator. So I took, I finally, it took all these years, I finally took that Papinator idea. And and I call myself the Papinator for this print, this poster I'm doing. And it's just me standing on the word Papinator. And it says the Papinator. And it's a really cool comic book drawing of me. And I think that's, people are going to love that. So what you're saying is you're going to get some CG artists for when you do the new show to make you look like the Papinator. So that <laughs> it's, in, in the interim, the Pappy's gotten buff. I don't know where this is all going to go, Ryan. I don't know anymore. It's... Uh, all I know is I'm enjoying life. I'm doing what I love to do. And a lot of people can't say that. No. You know? Not a lot of people can say that they uh, lose to ping pong to me every day. <laughs> <laughs> Keep on trying. Keep working hard. Remember when I talked about diligence? Mm-hmm. I talked about diligence. Be the best you can. Just do the best you can. Be the, be the best ping pong player you can be. That's all I can say. And actually, you've improved a lot. Thank you. Actually, you I, have. I've been trying. You have. Really I, when I watch you playing uh, Anthony, for instance, he's another fellow that works here at the uh, incubator here in uh, Ocala, Florida. And uh, he's – Ryan is very competitive now. At first, he was terrible. No offense, Ryan, but, I mean, everybody <laughs> who doesn't know how to play ping pong is terrible at first. Everybody. So don't feel slighted. But you've improved. Now you're slamming he'll, – he'll slam a, a, a slam shot on me, and I can't even get it. It's like – and an angle. He angles it like right off the table where I can't get to it quick enough. So you're definitely improving. Keep it up and we'll keep playing. Yeah. We'll probably end up playing later on after this podcast. Oh, we, we, we definitely will. And you're right. I've been I've been going for that angle for like three the weeks. The angle now is very deadly. In ping pong, the angle is what, what kills people. That's the whole idea behind table tennis mm. is to angle the shot where you hit it where the other guy can't get it. That's the essence of table tennis. And that's the essence of any ball game like tennis. Or table tennis. Hmm. You you always hit the ball where they can't get it. <laughs> and if they can get it, then you're not angling the ball enough right. or hitting it fast enough or high, you know, whatever the case might be. So, Well, I, I want to thank you, Mike, for coming in here because I, I had a really good time talking to you today. I and appreciate you giving me the time. I really do. I hope a lot of people got a good chance to maybe learn a little bit more about your show, the, the more of the background that goes on uh-huh. and just – more about you because you are a interesting person I, to get to know. Well, and talk I like to, to be uh, consider myself kind of like an interesting person, I guess. Yes, I have a lot. I have a lot that I've done in my lifetime, you know. And I, I think the Vietnam was just another trial in my life. I overcame that, and then I actually did a children's television program, hmm. which I think is a blessing in disguise, right there. So I'm happy. Yeah, I'm happy. So if you guys want to support. Pappy, get him, uh, give him some more support on social media, and when he gets that petition going, uh, I think everyone should sign it. See if we can get your show brought back in a new light. Yes, thank you. Know you. What I mean. Thank you very much. So, if you guys enjoy the podcast and you want to support us, all you got to do is leave a like, a comment, or subscribe, and we'll be back here at least once a week, every week. Have a good one, everyone. And now I'll go stop the recording. <laughs>